yeah, so go to the talk. I would like to introduce uh, Amy Wong. Amy is a PhD student in the Geography Department here at Royal Holloway University of London. And her, her project is based on high resolution crypto tephra investigation and Holocene environmental reconstruction from the uh, BART record of this man, a lake in, in the UK. So Amy is funded by the NERC doctoral uh, training program. And today she's going to tell us about her experience searching uh, Tefra ledgers in the Dismal Rec. Amy, all yours. Stop sharing. You can start sharing your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, will do. Thanks, Celia. And yeah, as Aid pointed out at the start, I managed to come dressed as evolved sediments today. So <laughs> ready for the talk. I uh, hopefully you should be able to see my screen, Celia. Can you see that? I can. Uh, I can see that. Yeah, perfect. Cool. Okay, so my talk today will focus first on introducing tephra for those who may not be familiar with the technique and the concepts of tephra stratigraphy and tephra chronology, really to highlight why barbed sediments are the ideal sedimentary structures for such studies. And this will set up the next section of my talk, which will focus on the study site of Dismir, my PhD study site pictured here in the UK, and the main outcomes of my TEFRA work that I've been undertaking on the sediments, um, highlighting the main challenges working with VARB sediments and crypto TEFRA and, and the main method methodological considerations in this field. Okay, I wanted to introduce the term TEFRA. It derives from the Greek word meaning ashes and it relates to products of explosive volcanism. So anything that comes out of a volcano during eruption and we mostly associate the term with a fine grained component of ash, which is less than two millimeters. And it, tephra can be deposited, um, it can be spread over thousands of kilometers from the source and it preserves in sediment sequences. And this tephra is deposited in a geological instant. And so it can act as this isochronous marker horizons in many sedimentary sequences, such as We've got ice cores, marine cores, lake sediments, peat bogs, and even caves. So we provide this means to link these records together and synchronize our geological, paleoenvironmental, and archaeological sequences. Um, but TEFRA practice itself requires the deposits to be characterized using the physical property, properties of the TEFRA and laboratory analyses. And it's these chemical signatures which allow the precise correlations between our sequences. Okay, I just wanted to define a few terms here. Um, and as I mentioned, so TEFRA can be exceptionally useful as a stratigraphic tool. And the term TEFRA stratigraphy refers to the study of the sequences of TEFRA layers and their related deposits and their relative ages. And that involves defining, describing and fingerprinting the geochemical signatures of these tephras, and it is that which underpins our tephra chronology. So the tephra chronology is the use of these tephra deposits as the isochrons to link sequences uh, with providing these precise tie points and establishing and transferring relative or numerical ages. So in other words, it's a age equivalent dating method, and we can import these dates into other sites um, stratigraphically link sites where we find these tephras and integrate and test our chronologies. We can also provide information about eruptive frequencies of volcanoes and any information on magmatic processes. Okay, so just to get a sense of the distribution of these tephra layers and this map here, um, this is from a paper by Plunkett and Pilcher in 2018. It's a really great example from Northwest Europe, which highlights the network of sites which contain tephra from dispersal centers. So we build these regional tephra stratigraphies and import information around our, our network as a way of understanding climate and environmental change. Um, and th this distal tephra knowledge isn't found anywhere else in the world as such. So Northwest Europe really is at the forefront of these studies. Um, but we also have tephra frontiers now and we're finding more and more Tefra in sites in Israel, Armenia, and in Greenland. And if anyone's part of the intimate group, there was a talk from Eliza Cook last week on the Greenland ice cores and Tefra in Greenland ice cores. Um, 
And as you will note in this map here, many identifications are located distantly from the source region, so where the volcanoes are situated, which brings us on to think about these distances that are travelled by tephra and what layers we might expect to find in our sequences. So the ash itself is transported by atmospheric circulation and eventually deposited. And proximal deposits, those closest to the eruption centres, typically contain the larger grains and exhibit a greater variety of erupted material. Um, but the fine material may be mobilised to much higher altitudes and transported greater distances. And this dispersal is often multi-directional, quite sporadic and difficult to predict. Um, and short-lived weather pa patterns will also play a role in the distribution of these tephras. Um, and when we speak of correlations, this encompasses many variations. So in the images here, you can see an example of a proximal to medial correlation. So proximal deposit in Germany um, and to that, the same tephra, the Lacazade is the name of the tephra in evolved sediment there. Um, but mostly our stratic correlations are distal to distal. And this is likely down to the fact that a lot of the proximal material closest to the eruption centre hasn't been studied yet or it's been destroyed by subsequent eruptions. So just to give an example, the Vede ash is found all over the North Atlantic region, but there's no convincing evidence in Iceland for the eruption. Um, it's mostly glaciated and subsequent eruptions of the source volcano, Katla, have distorted or removed the evidence. So that's why with these kind of distal records and valve records located at greater distances from the source, we sometimes get a less complicated view than proximal locations. We get a longer stratigraphic context preserved and we can relate products of different volcanoes through the superposition of these tephras. Um, but the downside being that not all tephras will be preserved in all cores. OK, so the geographical scope of tephra chronology has really expanded with methodological advances in the ability to detect this distal to ultra distal tephra, really far travelled fine grain crypto tephras, which are non visible to the naked eye. And so their shard size is often very small, less than 125 microns, and their ash, the shard numbers in the sediment sequences are between 10 and 2000 shards per gram of sediment. So we have to search for these and extract them from sediments. Um, and often only some eruptions will be available. And most often it's only the glass phase of the eruption that we find. And we do often have a sense of what it could be with the morphology. You find basaltic tephras or rhyolitic. We get a sense from the colour and the shape of these tephras. But we will really only know when we get that geochemical analysis on the glass. Um, and this is a paper here. So the first crypto tephra work was undertaken by labs in Edinburgh and Belfast in the 1980s. And they referred to it as micro tephra at the time. And this is the paper that first extracted crypto tephras from mineralogenic lake sediments. OK, I wanted to highlight some of the challenges to tephra stratigraphy. And the first being the issue of reworking in situ, loading and un unloading in lakes. Um, adding water or sediment which causes movement, processes of bioturbation which are really a principal concern in bogs um, and turbidite redeposition and can be distinguished from secondary input which is the remobilization of materials so that's when you have fluvial erosion or perennial snow beds, uh, snow beds sorry, um, iceberg rafting in marine contexts and ideally we want to see a sharp peak which marks that discrete isochron, that's the ideal. But obviously coming on to VARVs, in terms of sedimentary structures, VARV sediments are considered the ideal locations for tephra work. Um, the main downside being they're not always available, um, but tephra in VARVs derive, is derived from airfall surrounding slopes and glaciers. And um, when we think back to some of those challenges um, to tephra stratigraphy, VARVs cannot have bioturbation by their very nature and we can also exclude there's been no downwards reworking of said of tephra in the sediment sequence otherwise we'd be breaking the valve um, it may be continued to be deposited upwards through several centimeters um, and you can see in the example here uh, from McLeod 2008 the input of the tephra 
it was around 200 years at the most, which is consistent with glacial and snow melt in this region. These are glacial acustrine valves. So we need to think about the sediments that we're working with. Um, and this also means that wherever we find the tephra in a valve sequence, the first input must be the isochron, not, not the peak. So the first instance signals the eruptive event. Another reason why annually laminated like these valve sediment records are of particular value for tephra dating is because of their potential for something called differential dating, which is the precise determination of the time between volcanic ash layers. So I've got an example here, a paper by Ott et al. in 2016 discussed the Hasseldalen and Askia S tephras, which are key isochrons for synchronizing early Holocene records in Northwest Europe. And these have both been found in records um, that are not varved, um, but the age uncertainties reported for the tephras lead to quite large possible ranges for the time intervals between them. But when we find them in varved sediments, it allows us to independently determine the time span between both eruptions through differential dating, applying annual layer counting. And in the diagram here is from Zillen paper, which is looking at evolved lake sediments from Sweden. And we can see three eruptions all derived from Hecla in Iceland. And the absolute VARV intervals here have low uncertainty between the eruptions, which is almost impossible to do with other techniques. So we can transfer this information to other sites where we find these tephras in the sequence and it helps us to inform sedimentation rates and sequences where it's more difficult to determine. Okay, I want to bring up an example here where tephra has been used as a stratigraphic marker for looking at the differences in response to a climatic event. So a differential, that differential dating approach was also taken by Sabine Wolf um, in this diagram here uh, to constrain the time between tephra deposition and a rapid climatic event. And the paper identifies a 200 year interval between the Lacazette eruption and the start of the Younger Dryas involved records along a transect in north, uh, north central Europe. And the Lacazette tephra is contained as a visible tephra in a series of varved lakes from Germany and Switzerland as well. And these can all be linked directly together. And we can say that the Lacazette tephra was deposited 200 plus or minus four years before the onset of the young, Younger Dryas. So this is really precise information from the stratigraphic context that baths are providing us. However, although these tephra deposits of the Lacazette represent an important isochron for synchronizing proxy archives in the late glacial to early Holocene. Uncertainty in the age of these eruptions has prevailed. And so this paper um, from last year, the Reinig paper here, produces a new age estimate, which is around 130 years older than previously reported for the Lacazette tephra, which is contributing an independent near absolute tephra stratigraphic tie point for the late glacial. So although we might find this tephra across many records, that age of the tephra itself is subject to change. We want to be really certain we've got a correct age for that tephra. Another example I have here is from Glenn Roy from the Palmer et al paper in 2020. And the paper presents a revised VARV chronology for the duration of ice dammed lakes that formed in the Lochaba district in Scotland during the Younger Dryas. And it's the first annually resolved record from the UK spanning the Younger Dryas to early Holocene transition, which is securely anchored to an absolute timescale now by tephra chronology. And the study aimed to examine the precise timing of glacial and climatic events in the region and to compare these with key paleoclimatic shifts during the same interval in Northwest Europe. So the discovery um, of the Vede ash, which is dated to around 12,043 plus or minus 43 years, anchors the chronology now to an absolute timescale. And this is what allows um, the authors to draw comparisons with Mirfeld de Mar, Crockness and the Greenland record now. So we're starting to build a bigger picture. We can look at local processes but we can also compare them on much larger regional scales with tephra. Okay, so this brings us on to the site of Dismir, which is the study site for my PhD. And we now have two papers published from our work. Uh, the first outlining the chronology from the site, um, that's from Celia, 
Martin Poetis, and the second is the Tefro stratigraphy, and it's this paper which I'm going to delve a little bit into now in this second half. So a short introduction to the site, and Dismere is located in the town of Dis in Norfolk, which is the east of England, and the mere itself is a small circular marl lake um, sitting at an elevation of 29 metres above sea level with a surface area of around three hectares. Maximum water depth you can see in the bathymetry map here is six metres. The small catchment size around 1.5 kilometres squared and it has no surface inflows or outflows. Um, the origin of Dismere is bit unclear. Uh, it's possible explanation is related to thermocast processes in the Younger Dryas. Um, we had high water levels combined with cold climates which triggered solution of the chalk bedrock and led to this depression. Um, and the, obviously the key feature, so I'm speaking about the site today, which makes this lake very unique in the UK, is the preservation of the varved sediments in the record. Um, and the lake has been known about for some time, there's a long history of human occupation and the issue with some of these earlier papers on the site was that the carbonate rich mole lake sediments have proved very challenging for the development of reliable chronologies in the past because of hard water and geological carbonate contamination of the radiocarbon dates. So um, some of these previous studies, the Pegler studies, their age depth models were based upon correlation of the pollen stratigraphies with nearby sites and their radiocarbon dated diagrams. So there was large age uncertainties on this previous work. Um, whereas today, the cause we retrieved in 2016 um, has enabled us to produce a robust chronology based on VARV counting um, and the identification of the crypto tephra layers in the sequence and radiocarbon dates we have now found have helped us to anchor this VARV timescale to a calendar timescale. Okay, and you can see in this figure here to the right, the locations of the VARV sediments in the UK, uh, mostly glacial lacustrine and VARV records. And there are only three known VARV records of Holocene age in the UK. And this is Dismere, Rosthernmere in Cheshire and Lowpool uh, down in Cornwall. But Dis is the first to have a VARV chronology. And the age model for Dismere was developed through combination, as I just mentioned, of the VARV counts, radiocarbon dates and the tephra. So we've got the composite diagram here. We had four parallel sediment cores which were obtained from the deepest part of Dismere and the cores were correlated. We had a total of 67 macroscopically visible sedimentary marker layers and the best preserved sections were used to produce this composite profile here. Uh, the 15 metre record includes 4.2 metres of continuous sequence of well-preserved calcite organic valve sediments and these are present between 9 and 13 meters I've marked there on the in the sediment depths and they're composed of a pale calcite summer sub layer and a dark diatomaceous detritus winter layer and you can see here the they're very fine laminations average valve thickness are around 0.45 millimeters the annual detrital input into the lake is very low, um, except for the occasional seasonal lake turbidite deposited between the summer and winter layer. You can see in image C there. OK, so the disk chronology used a Bayesian age depth model, P sequence, to tie the resulting, the floating valve chronology to the INCAL 20 radiocarbon timescale, and it integrates 8,473 continuous valves, um, five radiocarbon dates and two known tephra layers. So these are called the Glengarry tephra and the OMH185 tephra. And that extends the valve sequence from around 2070 through to 10,290 years BP with a maximum absolute age uncertainty of plus or minus 55 years at the bottom. Um, and as you can see here, we present the valve counting and the radiocarbon dates through this through the same time window, which show very similar sedimentation rates. Um, because we have these different sources of chronological information, it was difficult to decide where to anchor our valve, valve chronology to the calendar timescale. And that's why we used a Bayesian model to combine this uncertainty. And the Bayesian model also helped us to identify an overcounting episode where we had a period of interpolation concentrated in 10 centimetres. 
um, the rest of the chronology was very well preserved. Okay, so a bit about kind of the aims of the, the TEFRA work on, on DSMIR. So in the British Isles, TEFRA investigations have really long centred upon study sites in Scotland, Ireland and the north of England. And it's, it was suggested that that spatial distribution in these northerly latitudes is driven by the assumed limits of dominant ash plumes from Iceland. And that was reflecting the kind of intensity of searches in, in those northern regions. Um, so we, but several studies had also demonstrated the potential for tephra repositories in southern Britain. Uh, crypto tephra deposits have now been found in Cornwall and Dartmoor, Exmoor and southern Wales. Um, so there was a bit of a spatial, spatial gap there and it was we wanted to see if sites in southern Britain could play an important role in advancing our understanding of tephra dispersal patterns and the associated, associated implications that could have for ash related hazard assessments. Um, and also, as I mentioned in the first half of this talk, VARs provide the dating ideal for tephras. So as a tephra is deposited effectively instantaneously, the VAR nature of the sediments provide the necessary stratigraphic control to distinguish multiple eruptions over short intervals and refine the ages of the preserved tephras with much improved precision. And the kind of key point, the starting point was we wanted to use tephra we hoped to use TEFRA to anchor our floating VAR chronology to the calendar timescale. Um, and we hoped that would enhance the record as an important paleoclimate and paleoenvironmental archive. OK, I will just provide some reflections on these methods later on. But um, this is the main TEFRA procedure that we, we use here at Royal Holloway. So for TEFRA analysis, we take initial rangefinder scan samples, so we take continuous blocks of the sediment, 10 centimetres were taken from the cores of the composite profile. And we then go back and target this at one centimetre, a point, stun, point, point sampling approach to refine our stratigraphic shard profiles. Um, and all the samples are sieved and cryptotephra extraction follows standard density separation procedures um, that are outlined in this Blockley et al. 2005 paper. The identification of the glass shards was then carried out using high powered polarizing mi microscopes and the major element geochemical analyses of these grains were then analyzed using an electron probe microanalyzer at Edinburgh. Um, the DSMIR data then had been ad analyzed using standard visualization approaches. We used biplots alongside statistical correlation techniques. So coming on to some of our results, we've discovered 15 crypto tephra layers in the laminated section of DSMIR here in the stratigraphic diagram. And we have found more tephra layers now in the upper nine meters of that, that non-laminated sediments too. And that's something we'll be investigating later down the line. Um, but we noticed that you have a lot more spread of the tephra through larger sections of the core. Um, that's why it's really exciting to find crypto tephra in the laminated sections here because we can refine tephra to half a centimeter. And we can see the locations of these in the sediment core here in this diagram from the Walsh et al paper. We managed to get geochemical analyses from nine of the DSMIR crypto tephra layers and we assigned eight of these eruptions to volcanic systems in Iceland and one to the Azores. Um, they had very low shard concentration. Some of the tephras that we didn't manage to get a geochemical analysis on had very low shard concentrations and very small shard sizes, which prohibited us from getting any meaningful data from them. But um, really, it just highlighted to us that the temporal expanse of a record like Dismir and Varved records themselves can reveal complexities in this European Holocene tephra dispersal. And you can see in the diagram here, this is something called a TAS plot, a total alkali silica plot. And this is how we first off is a kind of visualization approach to identifying and correlating tephras based on their chemistry, chemical properties. And we compared the tephra that we analyzed with other well-known tephra layers um, that are in the literature and on repositories such as Tefra Base and the Reset database. 
Okay, I wanted to highlight a few of the key findings from our TEFRA investigations and the main discovery being that the identification of a series of four distinct crypto tephra layers in the sediments which all share um, neuron identical geochemistry from the Hecla volcano in Iceland and these deposits are occurring within a uh, 960 year interval of continuous well preserved valves with a counting error of 13 within this section and the shard peaks themselves are confined to one to half a centimetre um, sediment samples and there's negligible shard counts in adjacent samples so they're very discrete, these discrete isochrons in the dysmere stratigraphy. Um, and this was an interesting discovery because in the current framework, that current TEFRA stratigraphic framework for Europe, um, there's only been one TEFRA, one eruptive event of Hecla recognised, and it's been termed the leg A. But with the resolution of a record like Dismir, we have revealed greater complex complexities in the eruptive history of this volcano. So we're at a site located at great distance from the source, but we're kind of starting to unravel some of the mysteries and finding there were more eruptions of Hecla than we once, once thought. Um, so this evidence for the multiple eruptions of Hecla with their indistinguishable geochemical fingerprints inevitably complicates the attribution of any single tephra deposit we might find in a site with layer A chemistry in non varved sedimentary records or records without sufficient support in chronological control. So we have to take caution if we employ layer A as an anchor point in any site. And we, we make this cl quite clear in the paper that you need to think about which, carefully about which tephras you might be using to anchor your chronology. Okay, the second key finding I wanted to briefly mention is that although the majority of tephras we identified were characterised as rhyolitic and Icelandic in origin, we also discovered tephra from the Azores, and this is located approximately 2,600 kilometres northeast of the Azores, and it has a trachytic composition. Um, and there's been a recent discovery of a furnace. Furnace is the name of the volcano we think it is likely to have derived from. And a recent discovery of a very similar tephra, cryptotephra layer, um, was found by Kinder et al. in Lake Sabinski in Poland in 2020, which further signif signifies favourable prevailing wind conditions for tephra dispersal towards the north and northeast of the Az Azores through this period. Okay, so to bring it together, we have extended the geographical ranges of the tephra, li tephra layers we have identified. And you can see from the map here, this is in the red. Uh, the majority of case, in the majority of cases, Dismir represents the southerly most identification of these tephras. And we hypothesize that other sites in southern Britain, potentially in northern France and Belgium, the Netherlands, could have the potential to capture these tephras. And it's when you accompany these with high resolution multi proxy data that these tephra isochrons will enable correlations and comparisons between sites, not only locally, but regionally and in some cases globally. Um, and these efforts are really providing a valuable contribution towards the development of a Holocene European stratigraphic framework. Okay, so I just wanted to um, speak about some reflections and methodological considerations with working with. Um, varved sediments and one is the first is the shard size so the average shard sizes in dismir required a much smaller beam size on the electron microprobe to obtain chemistry so they're much smaller than we might find in at more northerly latitudes and we uh, the sieve fraction that we used um, was key to re the retention of these shards in our samples. So we reiterate in the paper the need to adopt methodologies which facilitate the detection of these small shards and distal areas, particularly when working in southern Britain. Um, and next um, big thing I want to mention is that when we are sampling for tephra, we often start off with using a rangefinder approach. So we take 10 centimeter scans and you can see in the arrows along the bottom here, what we were discovering was that in 10 centimetre, these rangefinders, we weren't picking up any tephra. And as soon as we increased our resolution, we were increasing the, sh the shards per gram. And there was tephra visible in samples that we didn't previously um, 
think to look. So in VARVs, tephras are so well confi confined that it could be easy to miss layers if you're employing the scanning approach. So you need to take into consideration the time frame that your VARVs are representing, the average VARV thickness, and we recommend no greater than five centimetres, really. Um, and we also have started to target our searches for specific tephras. Now we've got our VARV chronology. If we're expecting to find certain tephras or we're surprised we haven't identified certain tephras that have been found elsewhere, we can start to target um, our search for these tephras, um, employing differential dating perhaps as well, which is why it's also key that we are reporting um, the differential dates and the VARV intervals between tephras in our publications. And on the, yeah, on the topic of reporting, all crypto tephra discoveries um, should be reported and any morphological characteristics, even if you don't get chemistry from them, uh, we just recommend it for a future reference. Um, the final point is that due to the similarities in the major and minor element geochemistry, tephras originating from successive eruptions could be mistaken in records with poor stratigraphic control for the same layer. So you might think that it's reworking. Um, so a target for future research in the tephra sphere is very much a more diagnostic chemical characterization of these crypto tephras using trace element data sets and working in combination with data from sites proximal to the source and, and these distal um, locations. And this diagram here is just from my paper and it's showing where the, the valves at the points of each of the tephra layers. Okay, so the crypto tephra discoveries really enhance the potential of Dismir as a record as a high resolution paleoclimatic and paleoenvironmental archive. And I just want to give a flavour of some of the work we are now undertaking in the Dismir Research Group. Um, we're starting to focus in on some time slices with multi-proxy approaches. Um, one such time slice is the 2.8 event, which covers the Homeric solar minima. And the VARVs and Dismir present the opportunity for a very detailed study of short-term changes in the environmental and climatic conditions through this period. And we've com combined diatoms, pollen and coronamids sorry, through this period. Um, we're hoping that to be, will be published very soon, Harding et al. Um, and within the DIS record, we have, we have also identified a key tephra in this time period, which we can correlate into a set of Irish peat bogs, um, which have, have highly resolved chronologies for human activity and environmental change. So we're starting to work with archaeologists as well, thinking about the effects of climatic deterioration and population declines, whether there's an association. And it's only with the resolution um, of VARVs and that key tephra that we are able to have such discussions. Okay, just to summarize here, um, TEFRA is a really key tool in understanding the quaternary record um, because it can link sites stratigraphically, it can provide these isochronous marker, marker layers, and we can use it to test our chronologies. But we need to keep in mind our research question if we're going to a core and we're wanting to find TEFRA because VARV chronologies can improve the dating of TEFRA, and TEFRA can help validate VARV chronologies. But we need to keep in mind, are we using the TEFRA to test our chronology, or are we using it to improve our chronology or fix it as such? And that, that's only really a debate that we can have as an option with other dating methods. Um, the idea and concept of differential dating is really key, so the spacing between TEFRAs is really valuable to be published. However, I hope to have um, made the point that successful TEFRA studies still require that understanding of the natural processes of production, dispersal and deposition and a rigorous approach to the detection, classification and correlation of these TEFRAs is really key. Okay, that's my final slide, but just to say thank you to the whole of the DIS team and my supervisors, Simon Blockley and Celia Martin Puertas there. And the I'm sponsored by the London NERC DTP, uh, but a big thanks to Chris Hayward. We use his lab up in the University of Edinburgh to for all our geochemical analyses. Okay, thank you. And any questions, happy to answer. 
So thank you, Amy, for this very interesting talk. So if uh, anyone has a question,